Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to give this another minute or two for other people to join here. 12 is a very small group. <clears throat> All right, I think we will get started here. Actually, sorry, give me one second. All right, so, um, as you've all probably seen, the results from the exam last week have been posted. Um, I don't know if any of you had any questions about the exam or... Um, I did want to mention that a few of you uh, kind of messaged me during the exam uh, about the fact that there was a diagram missing from one of the questions. And um, <laughs> that so the question referenced a diagram that wasn't there. Uh, so that was my bad that I forgot to uh, actually paste the diagram in there. So what I did is everybody in the class got a point for that question, no matter what you answered for it. So, um, but other than that, I don't think there are any errors in terms of uh, any of the questions or um, anything like that. So uh, I applied a curve to the entire class so that the average course score would be 85 uh, for that exam. And so the uh, grades are now posted on Canvas. Those are the curved grades. So those are the final. If you go in and <clears throat> look at your grade in detail in terms of the percentage that you answered right, it probably won't match up with the actual grade just because of that curve. Um, so that uh, that's basically that for the exam. And then today we're going to be jumping back into, we, we kind of, took a little detour for the exam away from uh, the GIS that we're working on. So we're going to go back into GIS. So let me share my screen here. And if you recall, So if you recall, we were talking about <clears throat> uh, before, before the exam and the exam review, we were talking about uh, GIS data types and GIS data sources. And we had gone through and looked at uh, some of the different places that you can download GIS data from. We had looked at uh, map projections. Right, so we'd gone through and looked at the different types of map projections and sort of what they mean in terms of uh, the types of distortion that they introduce into uh, flat maps. I'll fast forward through these. Right, and so we, <clears throat> we talked about uh, the different types of projections and how different they can be depending on 
uh, what you choose for your specific location. And we even talked a little bit about coordinate systems, which we'll talk uh, a little bit more about today because they get, uh, they're get they very important in terms of the accuracy when you're working in GIS. Uh, and that's kind of where we left it off before we went into uh, the review for the exam and all that stuff. So today what we're gonna do is um, a little overview of ArcGIS Pro. Um, some of you hopefully already have some experience with ArcGIS Pro uh, or I hopefully not with desktop, but um, if you do have experience with desktop, it's almost like learning an entirely new piece of software going to Pro because I've completely redesigned the interface. Um, so I just wanted to go through and talk about some of the things that you'll need to know so that on Wednesday, we can begin looking at some basic um, analyses in GIS and how they're applied to landscape ecology. So when you first open up ArcGIS Pro, you see a screen that looks like this. Um, over on the left side here, you have a list of your recent projects. So you can just click on one of those if you want to continue working on it. Um, they have resources on the right, things like blogs and you know uh, places where you can look at videos and learn more about GIS. And when you're starting a new project though, you want to look at the new section in the middle and you want to start a new project with a blank map template. So it has options for different blank templates here. I've never started a project with anything other than a map template. Uh, so that is typically where you want to start is by clicking on that button. And when you do so, it will create a new project. It'll open up a window and you can, <clears throat> excuse me, you can name your new project. So you give your project name Below that is a project directory. So it defaults to the documents folder on your computer. Um, and then inside of that, there's an ArcGIS folder and then a projects folder. And that's typically fine if you're just working on your own computer. If you're working on like a lab computer, you don't want to use that location because you um, that uh, will not be preserved if you go back in a couple of days. So what you can do is you can click on this little folder icon and browse to a different location. So if you're working at the library or on a lab computer, I would recommend that you uh, use a USB drive and browse to that USB drive and just have a, an ArcGIS projects folder set up on there and create all of your new projects inside that folder so that you can take it with you from place to place. Um, and then finally, down at the bottom, there's a checkbox to create a new folder for this project. You want to make sure that's always checked. Um, that will just create a new subfolder in the projects folder for that specific project. And once that's done, you hit OK. <clears throat> and then that brings you into um, the ArcGIS screen. So I want to give you a little uh, tour of what you're looking at here so that you have better understanding of it and hopefully it feels a little bit less overwhelming. So first we'll start at the upper left there. Um, you have the quick access, sorry, I'm gonna move my zoom bar out of the way here. You have your quick access tools uh, up on the left. So things like starting a new project, opening, saving, uh, undo, redo, et cetera. Why is this not advancing? Here we go. Um, below that, you have your ribbon tabs. So these are how you access different sets of tools. And those tools show up in the tool ribbon directly below those tabs. So um, by default, you typically start out on the map tab and you have the tools associated with that. But if you click on uh, other tabs up there, they'll open up different sets of tools that you can use. You'll notice that in between um, that on the tool ribbon, you'll have tools that are kind of grouped by uh, commonality. So tools that kind of do some similar things will typically be grouped together and you'll have these little lines in between and that just creates tool groups. On the left side, you have the contents pane. 
And uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that in just a minute. That's where you access all of the layers that are in your current map. You have your project tabs uh, right just to the right of that. So if you have multiple projects open, you'll see each one will have its own tab. In the center is the view pane where you see your actual map and all of the map data that you've imported into your map. Whoops. On the right side is the catalog pane. We'll also talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Uh, that's where you can access all of the data that you want to add to your map. Down at the bottom is the map scale. So that's the current uh, level of magnification for the map. And then just to the right of that is the coordinate display, which shows the current um, cartographic coordinates in latitude and longitude of wherever your cursor happens to be. All right, so first we're gonna start by talking about the catalog pane because this is really where you begin any project in terms of uh, working with any data that you found and downloaded. Right, so when you first look at the catalog pane in a new project, it just looks like this. And it has a listing of different things you can access. There are only certain parts of this that you really need to be concerned with for the time being. And those are uh, the folders, uh, the folder connections, which lets you connect to uh, different resources on your computer. The databases, which lets you um, access the geo database that you're working with or the current project. And then to open up any of these and expand them, you have the expand collapse button. That's that little triangle to the left of each of those folders. And that just expands that folder and shows you what's inside. So if we expand this, typically when, once you're working inside of a project, your catalog pane will look more like this. So again, there's our folder connections uh, folder. And now it's expanded to show us what's inside of it. And typically that's where you're going to find your shape files. So you remember we talked about uh, finding and downloading shape files on the web and saving them to a location. This is where you browse and browse to your shape files. And then up on top, you have your databases, right? And <clears throat> you always have a default geo database. This is created for you automatically when you start a new project. So um, if I create a new project called Denver Project, then the default geo database uh, would already be here waiting for me because it, the program automatically creates that database. And then inside that database, you can see a listing of the feature classes. So does anyone here know what the difference is between a shape file and a feature class? Because if you look at the listing of shape files, we have parcels and then up here we have parcels and down here we have traffic signals and up here we have traffic signals and it seems like they're all the same kind of information, right? So does anyone know what the difference is between feature classes and shape files? Take that as a no. So basically there actually is not much of a difference in terms of the data that they contain. They both contain the exact same type of data. So uh, shape files and feature classes are vector data for formats. Um, the main difference is that a shape file is just raw data that you've downloaded from the web. And a feature class is a shapefile that has been converted for use in ArcGIS Pro. Now you can use shapefiles directly in ArcGIS, but they don't work very well and they're slow and there are certain tools that just won't work at all if you're working with shapefiles. So whenever you download your shapefiles, this is what it's going to look like in your folder connections. You need to add them to your geo database in order to be able to use them properly in your map. So the process here is basically find data, download the data, um, find that data in the catalog pane in GIS and then add it to your geo database. And I'll, I'll go through an example of that uh, in a couple of minutes so that you can see what that process looks like. Uh, up on the top, there's a search window so that if you have like lots of different 
uh, data sets in there and you're looking for a particular one and you can't remember where it is, you can just search in there for it. And then next, um, we'll look at the contents pane. So that the catalog pane is where you search for and manage all of your data sets. The contents pane is where you manage the individual layers that are being used in your map, right? So it's just a listing of the layers that are available in the current map. The order in which those layers appear uh, in the contents pane is the same as the order of the layer display on the map, meaning that layers are at the top of that list are going to display on top of layers that are lower in the list. So it's very much like Photoshop in that sense. And then there's critical display and informational data on each map layer that's controlled primarily through the contents pane. And we'll see a couple of examples of that today. So this is what the contents pane might look like if you just have a couple of layers in your map. And again, there's a search window. If you have like tons of layers in there, you might want to search for something. If For the kinds of maps that we'll be doing this semester, that generally won't be an issue. Layer view tabs. Again, you don't really need to worry about this. Just leave it on uh, the default, which is the, uh, the tab all the way to the left. And then you have the name of your map. You can name your map whatever you want. By default, it's just called map, uh, but you might want to call it something a little bit more descriptive than that. And then beneath that, you have your layer names. So in this case, we have uh, essentially four layers, right? So you, we have street lights, buildings, world topographic map, and world hillshade. These last two are actually part of what's called a base map, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. That's just kind of your background information. So the actual layers of data we have in here are just street lights and buildings. And then beneath each one of the layer names, we have the layer symbol. So that's what the currently used symbol is on the map that denotes that particular type of data. Layer visibility is controlled by those check boxes. So a check means a layer is visible. And if you uncheck it, the layer is not visible. Uh, and then finally, again, you have those expand or collapse triangle buttons that just let you uh, expand or collapse all of your uh, listings in the contents pane. If you want to change the name of one of the layers in the contents pane, you can just click on the name and edit that name directly. Um, you, there are certain restrictions when you're naming feature classes that don't apply when you're uh, in the contents pane. And I'll uh, give you an example of that again in a minute uh, when we open up the software. Uh, again, if you want to toggle layer visibility, you turn the check mark on or off. You can modify feature symbol appearance just by clicking on the symbol thumbnail uh, in that contents pane. And if you want to see a layer's attribute table, you right click on it and choose attributes. So can someone remind us all what an attribute table is? Uh, just the information about the data that you're seeing. Correct. That's the tabular data that is connected to the, uh, to the geometry that you're seeing on the actual map. And then you can also select the base map, which is just kind of a, a background layer of information that's downloaded directly from the web. You don't have to download it. These are just built into ArcGIS. And you can select these by clicking on the map tab at the top and clicking on the base map button and then choosing one of these options. So these are all the different options that they give you here. And uh, you have things like imagery, which is aerial orthophotos. Um, you have, there's like a, I think there's one, yeah, National Geographic style map, which uses kind of the standards that National Geographic has developed over the years. You can use open street map. Um, you can use ter shaded terrain. Uh, there are all different sorts of styles that you can use. Um, typically, when I'm creating a map, especially if it's uh, for diagrammatic purposes to try to highlight certain information, 
One of the less obtrusive maps is usually a good option. So like I like to use light gray canvas because everything's just kind of faded out and very simple and it doesn't compete with your uh, actual data. Uh, or the there's another one, dark gray canvas is another one if you're using lighter colored layers. Uh, but typically I just like to choose those more uh, basic and, and faded types of uh, backgrounds for my maps. And then I want to uh, jump back into coordinate systems. So we mentioned this briefly when we were talking about uh, the different types of map projections. And you might remember this slide where we talked about uh, how coordinate system is basically a map projection that's centered on a particular point on the earth, which is known as a datum. And closer, the closer you are to that datum, the more accurate the map is going to be. The further away you get, the greater the distortion and the less accurate the map is. Um, there are hundreds or maybe even thousands of coordinate systems centered on different, probably thousands, centered on different parts of the earth. Um, if we look at the United States, there are a couple hundred uh, just in the United States alone. And the examples that we're looking at here are known as the state plane coordinate system. And these are uh, coordinate systems that are centered on specific parts of different states so that you can get accuracy for localized areas. Um, so you'll notice that Colorado here is split into three zones. Uh, there's a north, a central, and a south. So if you are working on a map in Fort Collins, for example, you might want to choose the Colorado North projection system. Uh, if you're working on Denver, you might choose Central. And then, well, you would definitely choose Central. And if you are working on, let's say, Pueblo, then you would choose the South projection. Um, and same thing goes for other states where, um, again, these are uh, subdivide into so many pieces so that you can get greater accuracy that's closer uh, so that the map datum is centered closer to the location that you're working on. So GIS data accuracy is directly tied to using the appropriate coordinate system. And the coordinate system for any feature class is the coordinate system that's saved in the original shapefile information. So when different organizations or agencies upload uh, GIS data to the web, it, they, they upload it, it's got embedded in it a certain coordinate system. It's not necessarily the coordinate system that you want to use in your GIS analysis. And one of the things that you need to be aware of is that the ArcGIS Pro map will automatically switch to the coordinate system of the first feature class that you import into your map. So as soon as you drag a layer and drop it into your map, what it, whatever the uh, coordinate system is for that particular feature class is going to determine the feature class for that map. Now you can change that. Um, but that's just something to be aware of because a lot of students, they forget about this step and it's a crucial step because you need to make sure that you're using the right coordinate system in order to have uh, accuracy in GIS. And this is important for any GIS map, but especially important in uh, landscape ecology applications because we're dealing so much with measurements and the measurements are not going to be accurate if you're using the incorrect coordinate system. <clears throat> so oftentimes you'll start a new map. This is a map of a portion of downtown Denver, and it might look like this. So what is wrong with this picture? Does anyone have an idea? Does anyone see anything wrong with this? It's not on the right uh, coordinate system. Correct. And how did you know that? <laughs> because uh, there's... Um buildings that are like going onto the street and stuff, I guess. It looks out of proportion. Yeah, it's, there's another, maybe a better description of what's wrong with it. Anyone? It looks like squished almost, like stretched. Yeah, just yeah. the way the image is shown. Yeah, it's kind of, it is kind of stressed. So it's basically, it's distorted. And the way that you can tell that easily, it actually looks fine. Like if you look at the orthogonal streets that are running east, west, or north, south, 
it looks fine, but when you see diagonal streets or diagonal buildings, they look funky, right? Like they're distorted. They, they basically are parallelograms instead of being nice rectangles. So one thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, when you're looking at a city grid, the streets are, all, are almost always in that grid at a 90 degree angle, right? They don't design cities with these like funky angled intersections because it just makes traffic engineering a nightmare. Um, and so when you see something like this where your building footprints and your street grid is kind of creating these parallelograms instead of rectangles, that's a good uh, sign that you're not in the correct coordinate system. Oh, or maybe you forget to turn on the 3D mode. Uh, sorry, forget to turn on what? 3D, 3D mode. It feels like it's 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 like 3D. Oh yeah, it, yeah, exactly. So you that forget to turn on. kind of makes it look like the map is, is what that we're seeing it like from a different viewpoint instead of straight ahead, straight above. And um, this semester we're going to be strictly looking at maps in 2D. So we're looking at them from straight above. Um, and so if you see that kind of distortion, it makes it look like it's in 3D, but it's not, it's just using the wrong coordinate system. So when you see that streets and building outlines are skewed or distorted like that, that's a giveaway that it's in the wrong coordinate system. So to fix that, you can right click on the map in the uh, contents pane and go down to properties down at the bottom. And then that opens up the map properties window and about halfway down on the left side, you have the coordinate systems tab uh, and you click on that. And then on the right side, it shows your options for different coordinate systems. So um, I'll walk you through how to change all of that in a couple of minutes when we open up the software. Um, but this is where you can select there's, and you'll see that there's tons of different options in here. And I'll show you where you can find those state plane coordinate systems that we'll primarily be using this semester. Right, and here's the, Here's what it looks like in the listing. So it's NAD. Does anyone remember what or know what NAD stands for in the context of a coordinate system? So it stands for North American Datum. And so that was basically a coordinate system specifically for North America that was designed in originally in the year 1983. So that's North American Datum of 1983. And then in parentheses, it says 2011, because that's the last time that that coordinate system was updated. So it's NAD 1983, updated in 2011. It's the state plane system. And then you can see there's some for California here. Here's Colorado Central. Uh, remember, there's a north, central, and south for Colorado. And in this case, the measurement units that's set to is US feet. Uh, you can also choose state plane coordinate systems that are set to meters. Um, but uh, you know, when we're working in the US, typically we're working in feet and inches. Right. And so again, that's always what you want to look for uh, to get the greatest accuracy is that state plane coordinate system for uh, any kind of work in the United States. Now, sometimes uh, if you're working on really large scale analyses where you're looking, for example, at like an entire state, like the whole state of Colorado, um, a good alternative to use is uh, UTM, which stands for Universal Transverse Mercator. And basically these are uh, these sort of wedge shaped slices that go through the United States from north to south. And uh, there's, um, you know, they break up the United States, I want to say into, I forget exactly how many regions, but I think there are about eight, eight of these slices going through the United States or maybe 10. And so the one that goes right through Colorado is UTM zone 13 North. And so that's a really good one to, to use if you're looking at an analysis that deals with the whole state and you're not just focus on a specific part of the state. So UTM 13 North will cover all of Colorado and get you good uh, measurement accuracy. 
right? So if we go back and we look at, again, that skewed map that we had, the reason it's skewed is because this um, data set, in this case, we're looking at building footprints. Uh, these building footprints were saved using the World Geographic System, WGS of 1984 coordinate system. Um, and that's, you know, okay if you're looking at like continental scale data, but looking for specific data in Colorado is not very accurate, as you can see by the distorted data. And if that's corrected to use the state plane coordinate system, this is what it looks like, right? So you can see now all of the buildings and all of the streets are at nice right angles where they meet at the corners. And so that tells you that now we're using uh, the correct coordinate system. And then once the uh, coordinate system is set, any new feature classes that you add to that map will automatically adapt to that coordinate system. So um, typically coordinate system is something that you just set once on any given project and then you're done with it for the rest of that project. Because once you set it in the map, anything else new that you add to that map is going to adapt to that coordinate system and you don't have to worry about it again. All right, so let's look at some <clears throat> examples of that in the actual GIS software. So I'm going to go into GIS. So this is the uh, GIS screen. Let's make this a little bigger, here we go. So again, over on the left, I have a listing of all of my recent projects in the center. If we want to start a new project, what am I going to start with? Anyone, what button do I want to hit to start a new project? A blank map. template map. Yeah. yeah, a new blank map. map template. So I'll click on this map button and it's asking where I want to save it. If um, I don't want to save it in the default documents folder. I can just click on this folder icon, whoops, and it opened it on my other screen. And it opens a window like this where you can browse to wherever you might want to save that project. Um, I'm going to create, um, we'll call this Denver sample. Right, and I'm just going to create in there. I want to make sure that create new folder is always checked. I'll click OK. And it takes a second for it to get all set up here. All right, so by default, it opens up um, just a map of the entire United States. Again, over on the left, we have our contents pane. On the right, the catalog pane. Um, let's say, so right now, by default, it's set to the world top topographic map. If we wanted to change that um, base map to something else, let's say we wanted to change it to an aerial photo, what would we do? What tab do we go to and what button do we hit to get to our base maps? Anyone remember? You go to the map tab. Correct. And then what button? And the base map under right. layer. And it has that pull down menu. Exactly. So I click on the base map menu. Here are the options, right, for all my different base maps here. So if I wanted to do an aerial photo, I could choose imagery. And we'll see that that will change. Right. And I can. Zooming and panning is, is pretty straightforward. It's pretty much the same as zooming and panning in Google Earth or um, on online maps where you roll the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. Um, if you just click and drag on your mouse wheel, uh, you can pan. Right, so let's, let's find a little, here's a little populated area. Right, so here's an aerial photo of it. If we wanted to change the base map again, I can download this. If we want a base map that's uh, an aerial photo with labels on it, we can use this imagery hybrid. Right, and so now you can see it's added some street names on here. Um, there's also just a plain street map. Let's go to light gray canvas. That's one of my favorites for creating new maps. 
see how nice and simple and clean this map is. It's not cluttered with too much information. It just gives you enough information that you need so that whatever data you're adding to that map uh, can be seen easily. Right, and if I zoom in, it shows a little bit more information here. I think this one might show, no, this one doesn't show any building footprints. There are some others here. If we go down here, um, topographic, for example, will show some hill shade, right? So you can see if we zoom out here, it has some hill shading included. And one of the things to keep in mind is that the map itself and the hill shade are two different uh, pieces of that base map. So if we just wanted to see this map without the hill shade, I can uncheck hill shade and it'll turn off that part of the map. And then I'm just seeing the map uh, as if it's just a plain street map, right? Or likewise, I can turn on the hill shade, turn off the topographic maps that we just have the hill shade portion. And that's true for any of the base maps that have multiple parts to them that you can turn on or off those multiple parts. Uh, let's go in here. Open street maps is sometimes a good one. Are, is anyone in the class familiar with open street maps? Know what it is? What we were looking at right now? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so OpenStreetMaps is actually, it's an online uh, web portal that's basically, it's the Wikipedia equivalent of maps. So it's a map that is open source that anybody can go in and modify. And those actually tend to be the most accurate maps because uh, sometimes there's like a new uh, development that's being built and um, the streets in that new development haven't been added to the, sort of the uh, official maps that you find on Google yet. But if you go to OpenStreetMaps, somebody's actually gone in and added those streets in there. Um, and because it's open source and people can add to it, it tends to have a lot more detailed information, just tends to be a lot more accurate. Um, so that's uh, OpenStreetMaps. And you can see in here that OpenStreetMaps includes like building footprints and um, you know, main roads, obviously, parks and open spaces, water bodies, uh, other types of information. And then they just have some fun base maps in here too. Like if you drop this down, there's this mid-century map, which, you know, uses like, you can see like kind of the fonts that it uses are kind of looking, um, you know, they, they have this sort of uh, mad, Mad Men <laughs> type of style to it. Um, there's a colored pencil map. Right, so they you can kind of have fun with these. Um, firefly imagery, I believe that's nighttime aerial photos. Nope, it's daytime. What happens if I zoom out? I'm not sure what the Firefly base map is. Um, and then they have like a blueprint version, all these different things that you can play with. Um, typically, I like to not get too creative with the base maps because they just get distracting from the information that you're trying to show. Um, so I am just going to go with light gray canvas. For this example, we'll zoom in on Denver. Right, if we zoom in enough, you can see some building footprints in here. There's some like this gray green that indicates park areas. But again, this kind of light gray canvas is just a nice one for um, keeping all of your background information muted. All right, um, I don't think, have I walked you guys through an example of finding and downloading actual data on the web? And bringing that, I, I know we haven't looked at bringing it into GIS yet, but just downloading and what you need to do with your GIS data when you download it. I don't think so. I don't think so either. So I will walk you guys through that. Um, so since I'm doing an example in Denver, whoops, let's bring my web browser over here. So I'm going to look for, um, Denver open data. So if you recall, when we were talking about data sources, 
Um, open data is the terminology that's used to refer to GIS data that's freely available on the web. So if you're looking for open data for a specific place, it's usually a good way, uh, a good place to start, or GIS data rather, a good place to start is to type in the name of the place followed by open data. And more often than not, you'll find some kind of open data GIS source. Right, so here we have the Denver Open Data Catalog. So I can click on that. And this is what the uh, Denver Open Data Catalog looks like. So I can search for specific data sets up here, like if I wanted to look for streets. Type that in, you can see they have street light poles and street routes and street address and street center lines and so forth. Um, I can also, if we clear my search query here, uh, let's go back to that start page that we're at here. So they have like featured data sets. Here are some recently updated ones like um, police pedestrian stops and vehicle stops, liquor licenses. Um, but you'll notice also there's an option to view all data sets. And sometimes that can be a really good way of getting an, a sense of what kinds of data are available for that location. So if I click on view all data sets, it's just going to give me a listing here um and we'll see like you know community network boundaries and department of motor vehicle offices we'll go to the next page aerial imagery from 1995 if you need historic imagery fire districts adult asthma rates railroad crossings traffic signals foreclosures tree canopies denver bike ramps election precincts, sidewalk polygons, all kinds of information that you can get. So browsing through that information is sometimes a good way of seeing, just getting a good sense in your head of what kinds of data are available. And up here, you'll see it's listing that there are 264 data sets available for the city of Denver, right? So if we want to look for one of these, so let's go back to, um, Let's look for police and see what that has. So we have police precincts, police districts, police stations, Denver police officer involved shootings, police pedestrian stops and vehicle stops. So uh, actually more pages of data too. Traffic accidents, crime, hate crimes, liquor licenses. So let's say we want to get data on the locations of police stations. So I'll click on police stations and then here, it shows me some information about uh, the data that's available. Down here, we have different data formats. What data format do I want to download to use an ArcGIS? Geodatabase or like a shapefile, right? Yep. So either one of those will work. Um, in this case, I'm going to choose a uh, shapefile just because they're a little bit easier to organize than uh, geodatabases. So I will go into download next to shapefile. And we're going to download, I need to choose where to download this to. So I actually have on my C drive, I have this GIS data folder already set up and I have a folder here for Denver and I'm just going to download it into that folder. So police stations, you'll notice it's a zip file by the way. So I'll click save. And that saves the data. And now we cannot use that zip file directly in ArcGIS. We actually need to, if I minimize this and I browse to that C drive, give me a second here. There we go. Right, so if we go to my C drive and we go to GIS data, uh, then Denver, Right, so here's that zip file. I cannot use it in its zip format in GIS. I need to extract it. And um, the way I do that is I right click on it and then I can just choose extract all. And whoops, it opened it in my other window. So here it opens a window asking what you wanna do. It's, what it's going to do is create a new folder 
for that shapefile, which is fine. I'll click extract. Right, and so now it created a new folder called police stations and it has all of this, all of these different files in here. Do I need all of these different files or do, it, do I just need the shape file? Shape file. Incorrect, I need all of them. So the shape, when we refer to a shape file in GIS, it's actually a collection of files. So the name is a little bit misleading. Uh, we actually need to keep all of these. So don't delete any of it. Make sure you keep all of them or the shapefile will not work in GIS. So you can see here now it created a new folder called police stations. I don't need the zip file anymore. The zip file is just a compressed version so that it downloads faster. Um, so once I've extracted that zip file, I don't need the zip file anymore and I can just delete that. All right, so now that that's done, we want to find this data and use it in GIS. So let's go back to ArcGIS Pro. And we're going to look in the catalog pane for our data, right? So um, in order to find data, we're going to look in this in our folder connection. So let's open that up. And right now it's only connecting me to the folder I created for this project. I can't see any other folder connections. So folder connections are basically just locations on your hard drive. Um, by default, GIS doesn't have access to your whole hard drive. I don't know why, it's kind of dumb, but it doesn't. And so you need to create a folder connection in order to access different parts of the drive. So I'm going to right click where it says folders and choose add folder connection. Right, and so now if I browse to my C drive and then I go to GIS data, I'm just going to, that's as far as I want to go because the, once I click on that, that folder connection will give me uh, access to everything inside of that folder. So I'll click OK here. You can see now over here in my catalog pane, it added, let's get this window off of there, it added um, GIS data as this a folder I can access. If I expand that, there's all my GIS data. I can go into Denver. There's all my shape files. And if we go into police stations, there's the shape file that we downloaded, right? It only shows the individual shape file, um, but all of those other files are still required for the shape file to work properly in GIS. Now, if I open some of these other ones, I've already previously downloaded like parcels, um, or let's do, what else do we have in here? Uh, street center lines, right? So if you notice, I'll see if I can, can't really zoom in on these, but they have different symbols which represent the topological level of that data. So police stations are showing up as dots, which means that's point data. Uh, street center lines, this is the symbol for line data. And then parcels, this is the symbol for polygon data. So let's start with the police stations and I will drag those police stations into my map. There we go. And you can see it's showing the locations of all the police stations in the map. Now, you never want to do that. You never want to do what I just did. Right? I'm just showing you, you can do it if you just want to look at the data and review it and see what's in, involved. Um, but you never want to add data to your map that way. And that's because shape files are not formatted yet for use in ArcGIS and they're very inefficient and they don't work with lots of types of operations that you do. So I'm going to come over here to my contents pane. I'm going to right click on police stations and I will remove that layer. And so this time I'll show you what you actually need to do to add it to your geo database. So up here, Denver sample is our geo database. If I hit the triangle next to it, it doesn't show anything because it's currently empty. A geo database is just a container that holds all the information that you're using for that project. So to bring police stations into that geo database, I can right click on it and I'll come down to import and then feature class. And so what that means is that I'm, I want to import some kind of information into this to create a new feature class. So I will click on that and it opens up this 
geoprocessing pane. And we'll give it a minute to get all set up here. There we go. So first it's asking for input features. And you'll notice that some of these items have a little red asterisk next to them. That means that that is required that you must fill in that information before you can execute this tool. So first it wants to know what's the input feature? What's the data that you want to bring into the geo database? So I'm going to click on the browse folder and I'm going to browse to my folder connection. So over here under project that has my folder connections, I'll go to GIS data, go to Denver, there's my police stations. I'll click on that shape file and I'll click okay. So we see police stations.shp is the input features. I'm adding it to Denver sample GDB, that's my geo database. And then the output name is just the name of the feature class when you bring it into um, ArcGIS Pro. So if I just call this police stations like that, it won't work. And that's because there are certain requirements for naming feature classes. Uh, there are basically two important rules. The first rule is that you cannot have spaces in the name. And so since I have a space in here, um, that's not going to work. I cannot have this, a space in the name of a feature class. I also cannot start a feature class with a number. It can have a number in the name, but it cannot start with a number. They're kind of these bizarre random rules, but that's what they are. So what I'm going to do instead of calling it police space stations, I'm going to change the name here to police stations like that with no space in it. Right. Everything else we can leave the way it is. I can click run down here. Right. And you can see it added it as a uh, automatically to the map as police stations. Um, and by the way, I just want to show you what happens. Let's put a space in that. Right. And let's try running it again. Notice it gave me this red X next to the output name. That's telling me basically ah, that's not going to work because this is an invalid feature class name, right? So you'll get a little error that tells you where the problem is if the tool isn't running properly. All right, so we have police stations in there. Let's close that geoprocessing pane. And now we're back in our catalog pane. You can see that under Denver sample GDB, it's added police stations. Sometimes the new feature classes you've added don't show up right away. If they don't, you can just right click on the geo database and you can choose refresh down here. And that'll just kind of reload the listing for that geo database. And then you should see your uh, feature classes in there. Right, so these are our police stations and let's zoom in. Right, so here's a police station down here. If I want to find information about that police station, I can click on it. There we go, it takes a second. Right, and gives us a pop-up menu uh, or a pop-up window rather. And then it shows all the information available for that particular uh, or for the police stations in general for that whole layer of data. So for this police station, um, it's police station eight, I get where the station name is D6. The full name is District 6. Um, it shows the address of it, 1566 North Washington Street, the phone number. Um, it's staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, is it publicly accessible? Yes. So there's different kinds of information that's uh, available in the attribute table about that uh, particular police station. Now, when I pulled in those police stations, something got all screwy with the streets in downtown Denver. What happened? What's going on here? A coordinate system change. Yes, because it was looking at the default coordinate system for that shapefile and it changed the coordinate system to that shapefile because that was the first one I added to my map. 
So we want to change the coordinate system. Does anyone remember where we do that? You just right click the layer and go into properties. Uh, actually right click on map. Yeah. And then you go to properties. And then in, <clears throat> in the map properties, we want to click on coordinate systems. And you can see it's set to WGS 1984. That's World Geographic System 1984. That's kind of a default um, coordinate system that most shape files are saved in. And um, because that's skewing everything, and we know it's not going to be an accurate one to use for a localized map of Denver. So we want to change this to the state plane coordinate system. So in order to do that, I will scroll down. State plane is a projected coordinate system. So I will hit the triangle next to that. If I scroll down, we will find state plane. I'll hit the triangle next to that. Then I want NAD, North American Datum, 1983, 2011. What kind of units do we think, do you think we want? International feet, meters, or US feet? US feet. US feet, yeah. I don't even know what international feet are, <laughs> but um, we will use US feet. So we're going to open that up. And now we have all the different state plane coordinate systems listed here in alphabetical order. So I'm going to scroll down till I see Colorado. So we have Colorado Central, North and South. Denver's kind of right in the middle of the state if you look at the way that those three are divided up. So I'm going to choose Colorado Central and click OK and watch what happens to the map. Like magic, it's now in the right coordinate system. All of our streets are at right angles the way they should be. Right? All right, let's look at some of the other data that's available um, in here. So some of this stuff I've already downloaded, this all just came from Denver Open Data. Uh, let's bring in an example of some line data. So street center lines. Again, do I wanna just drag this directly into my map? No, no, no. why not, Josias? Um, because the shape files aren't, um, uh, geez, I forgot the word you used. They're not um, formatted yet. Right. So we need to format it for use in GIS by adding it to our geo database. So I can right click on my geo database, import, and now I can either do feature class or if you're doing a bunch all at the same time, you can choose feature classes. So I'm going to do that one so I can add several. So I'll click on the folder here and I will browse. Let's go up a level. So we already got police stations. Let's get building outlines. Click OK. And then there's another line here. So I can click the folder for that one. And I can browse to parcels. We'll bring that in. I can click the next folder. We can bring in as many as we want here. So let's do street center lines. I'm going to get all of them folder. Next we'll do traffic signals. And finally, there was one more in there. Tree canopy. Whoops. Right, so it's going to add all of these. And because we're adding multiple, it doesn't ask for what we want to name each one of those feature classes, it'll just automatically name it whatever the name of the shape file is. We're bringing them into our Denver sample geodatabase, so that's all set. So now I can just click run. And this might take a second as it um, adds that data. Some of these, like especially the building footprints, have a lot of information in them. It's going super slow. I'll probably stop it and just um, add fewer layers so that, so that we don't use up all the class time waiting for GIS.
Yeah, it's going super slow. All right, let's not do it that way. Let's cancel that. There we go. All right, so let's not bring in so many. So let's get rid of, we can up here, if you hover to the left of some of these layers, you can hit the little X to get rid of them. So I don't want, um, well, here we go. Let's get rid of building outlines since I know that's a really big one. And I'll get rid of the traffic signals. There's a lot of traffic signals. I know tree canopy is pretty big. Let's just do parcels and streets. See how that goes. Okay, let's hit run. I'm just going to give it a minute. I know it it looks scary that it says 0% as it's not moving, but sometimes it'll just all of a sudden in one jump go up to like 70%. Um, we will see if this does. <laughs> it's being kind of slow. And, and Zoom slows down every other application you run. So I'm sure Zoom is how, usually when I'm adding feature class, it goes a lot faster than this. So um, Zoom is probably just slowing everything down. All right, let's cancel. Oh, there it goes. See how it just jumped to 50? There we go. So I'm just going to wait and let it finish. I was about to say, I was working with a uh, big, big contour file. It was probably too big of a file, but I was just trying to clip it. And it took like 10 minutes for the process to yeah. Yeah. Con contours are, yeah. Contours, uh, street center lines, building out lines are like notoriously big data sets that just take forever to work with. All right. So now I can close that geoprocessing window. Now, when you add multiple feature classes to your geo database, it will not automatically add them to the map. So we need to add them manually from our databases. So I'll go up here to Denver sample GDB, right? It's still only showing police stations. So I need to refresh this so that will show the rest of the ones I just added. So I'll just right click on Denver sample and I will choose refresh. There they are. So now you can see build, oh, really? Building outlines came in? That's interesting. I wonder if it actually worked. I'll try, let's zoom in here. I'll try dragging Denver uh, building outlines and see if it might have already brought those in before I canceled last time. Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, so I guess before I canceled the first process, it had already brought in the building outlines. So we have building outlines, we have parcels, right? And again, I'm adding these to the map just by dragging them in. So I'll drag parcels, come on, grab it. Drag it, there we go. There's our parcels. We already have police stations. We'll bring in our street center lines. Right, so here's all of our data. And the order in which they're listed over here in the contents is the order in which they show up. So right now my parcels are over top of my building so I can't see my buildings anymore. So if I want to change the order, I can just drag those around in this list. So for example, I can take building outlines here and I'll click and drag on it and I'll move it above parcels. And now we can see our building footprints over top of the parcels layer. Um, there's police stations, streets are fine where they are. If you don't like the way these are named in the contents pane, you can change the name to anything you want with numbers or spaces or whatever you want. Um, <clears throat> so if you want this to look a little bit better, like police stations, we can go in here, just click on it and I can add a space. Right, I can go here and instead of street center line, I'll just call this one streets. Call this one uh, building footprints 
and I'll call this one parcels. Right, and then underneath each one, we see the symbology for what that particular symbol looks like on the map, right? So let's say we wanted to change the way that some of these are um, showing up. And by the way, before we get too far, I do wanna mention that uh, a good thing to keep in mind in GIS is the fact that um, there are two things that can slow it down. One is um, having is being zoomed out too far. So if you're zoomed out really far, it takes a long time for the map to regenerate, right? So if you're just trying to like, you know, let's say change the way that uh, your buildings look on your map, you don't need to be zoomed all the way out to do that. You can zoom in, right? And if I zoom in to like this level, for example, the map will regenerate more quickly. The other thing is the number of layers that are turned on, right? So a lot of times I like to turn off any layers that I'm not currently working with because that will save memory and it'll make it faster for me to pan around and zoom and so forth. Now, this normally works a lot faster than what you're seeing. Zoom is slowing it down currently, um, but when you're working in your own uh, map, it'll, it'll go a lot faster when you start turning layers off. So let's go to building footprints. And in order to change the symbology of that layer, all I need to do is click on uh, the symbol down here for building footprints. Right, and there are two ways that we can change these. One is that we have a gallery here, which basically has these sort of preset uh, options for how I might want to show my buildings or I can click on properties and it gives me some basic properties for how I want to make my buildings look. So there's color, which is the fill color. There's an outline color and then a thickness of the outline. So if I wanted to make these buildings um, look like a figure ground diagram, for example, then what I could do is I could change the color to black for the fill um, I don't need an outline on them because the whole thing is just going to be filled in black. And in fact, it's better not to have an outline. Um, and I'll explain why in a second, um, but let's change that to no color and I'll click apply. And in fact, if we turn off our base map too, there you go. You have a figure ground diagram of buildings, right? Now, the reason I turned off the outlines of the buildings is because the outline has a thickness to it. And as you zoom out, that thickness um, updates so that it's always looking the same on the map at different scales. So what I mean by that is let's give it a black outline with a one point thickness. If I hit apply down here, watch what happens to the buildings. Right, see how they all got kind of, you know, they have these like thick outlines on them now. And they're kind of, if I zoom out enough, they're all sort of bleeding into each other. And it makes it hard to see where one building stops and the next one starts. So it just gives you a much cleaner result. For example, if you just turn off that building color and just set that to no color, and I hit apply again, and you'll see that the buildings will look a lot more crisp. There we go. So that's the actual kind of building footprints there. Right, or like I mentioned, you can just go to the gallery and you can choose uh, a preset from the gallery. So if you just wanted to show the buildings as black outlines without a fill, then you can just choose black outline and it'll update those so that the buildings show up as black outlines. And you can do that for any of these uh, symbols over here on the left. So um, let's turn off our buildings. Let's turn on the streets. <clears throat> the streets are just these green lines. That's not particularly helpful. Right, so let's change those to some nice thick medium gray lines. So I'll change the color here to medium gray. I'll change the thickness. Let's go, let's try like 12 point. I'll click apply. So there's our streets. There's our building footprints. Let's turn on some parcels. Right, again, these parcels can be probably shown in a better way. So I'll click on the symbol for parcels. Let's go to the gallery. They have like a dashed line option. 
right? So you can very quickly sort of fine tune the way that your map looks just by changing that symbology along the left. And um, apologies to those of you who had uh, urban design with me already. Some of this stuff is familiar. I know I just want to kind of get everyone up to the same level so that um, on Wednesday we can be uh, talking about some of the basic types of analyses that we can do for landscape ecology in GIS. So um, I think that pretty much covers, or, oh, attribute tables. So if you wanted to see attribute tables for individual layers, um, like let's say the police stations, you just right click on that layer and then you click on the attribute table. And then that will list the attributes down here. I'll give this a second. And I can stretch this just to make that attribute table a little bit bigger. Right in here along the top, you see a listing of all the different fields available uh, that we have information for. And then for each object, you have a listing. And you can, this is interactive. All this data is interactive with the map, right? So if I turn on my police stations, and let's say I wanted to see where the District 1 station is. I can select it by clicking on uh, the little gray square next to District 1. And then if I want to see where it is, because I can't finding that on the map could take me a while, I can just right click on that and I can choose zoom to. And it'll zoom to the location and there's that point for that police station. Right, and we can see where in Denver that particular location is. Uh, or likewise, if we go into, let's go into our streets here. I'll open up that attribute table. And give this a second to load. Go back down a little bit. So let's say we wanted to see where 6th Avenue is. I can just select it here again from that attribute table. I can right click on it and then I can choose zoom to. Right and there you can see highlighted that segment of 6th Avenue. And then now we know where in Denver that particular street is. So the, the data that's in the attribute table, table and the data that you're seeing in the map are interactive with, with one another. Um, later on, when we get into like selecting objects, if you select something in the map, it becomes highlighted in the attribute table. So uh, you can always kind of have that direct relationship between those two sets of information. And that is it for today. So I think everyone's kind of at the same basic level of GIS knowledge now that you need so that on Wednesday we can begin looking at um, some basic types of analyses that we, we might do for uh, landscape ecology applications. So uh, that is it for today, unless there are any questions. I'll take that as a no. So. That's it. Have a good one, everyone. Have a good day, and I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Thanks.